this is brought to you. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find the links to the blogs, the Twitters, the entire back catalog of every single episode we have ever done, in which we now have more than 100. Once again, I have here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks a lot for your time. Hey, Brock. It's always good to do another podcast. We've been a little slack recently, so uh, good to get back in the groove here. We got this one up today. We got a few more queued up, but it's getting into the busy season for HPC. Yeah, so we have uh, supercomputing coming up in November, so we're at the very end of September here. Um, so we were only about a month away from supercomputing, a little more than that. I will be there. Uh, University of Michigan will be having its joint booth with Michigan State University again this year. I will be floating around there and floating around other places. Jeff, Cisco always has a booth. Yeah, we have a booth. Unfortunately, we have a fairly terrible position on the floor this year due to some silliness. But we'll be there. Um, I got my normal Open MPI State of the Union boff with uh, George Basilica, my co-host, another one of the Open MPI core developers. Um, also helping out with a Lib Fabric tutorial. Lib Fabric is the new up and coming low level network API. We got that on, um, I believe it's Sunday, it might be Monday. I'm afraid I don't remember offhand. Um, but yeah, those are the big things that I'm doing at Supercomputing this year. What else you got going on? So what we've got going on is we will be announcing a couple of interesting things that we got going on at Michigan that you can come by and talk to us about at our booth. We have our new uh, Institute for Data-Driven Computational Physics, which we recently got funded to create. Uh, but the big, big thing that's going on is the new Data Science Initiative coming out of the University of Michigan. This is going to be really the kickoff event for the Michigan Institute for Data Science. Uh, we're going to be creating a graduate program, which we already have students enrolled for the fall. And the university is investing about $100 million, and we're going to create 35 new faculty positions. We're putting up a bunch of medium and big data infrastructure, uh, which is really kind of stretching the sorts of things that we've traditionally done here at Michigan. And we're really excited about some of the things we can do. We're already getting our health system lined up for health data. We've got transportation data. We've got all sorts of crazy things going on. We're going to try to bring it all together and look at finally filter through all this data. So come by and talk to us about that. One hundred million dollars. Right, it's real money, real money, real money. All right. Well, what are we what are we talking about today? So today we're going to be talking about um, something that I know actually very little about, and I hope to get some clarification about my understanding. Of this we're going to be talking um, with a researcher who's created a piece of software called Conduit. So uh, why don't we have our guests go ahead and introduce themselves? Yes, hi. So I'm Cyrus Harrison from Lawrence Livermore Lab, and um, I'm known primarily for my work on Visit, which is an open source visualization tool. But today I'm here to talk to you about Conduit, which is a smaller effort we've been working on for the last few years. So um, can you give us an idea of what Conduit is? All right, so Conduit's something we've been looking at to sort of simplify our daily life and data exchange between simulation codes, you know, as a whole. So people who write big big physics simulation codes, um, they usually have to deal with I.O. and deal with mesh-aware I.O., for example. And there's a lot of pain in dealing with static APIs and things of that nature. So Conduit was designed to sort of tug at that and make things a little bit easier with respect to passing data to and from, say, a visualization tool or and a, sim and a simulation code. So this was a little bit confusing when I was reading through stuff. A, a name like Conduit almost sounds like it's a, a communication or some sort of networking thing, but then you talk about you know, you know, describing data structures and stuff, and you talk about communicating between other things. Can, can you get a little bit more clarification? Does it, is it one? Is it the other? Is it both? It's both. Um, so at its, core, at its core, Conduit is really just about describing hierarchical data. So the best way to think about it is sort of if you cross, you know, JSON, JavaScript object, JavaScript object notation, with NumPy. Um, so NumPy has been used very successfully in the scientific community, the scientific Python community, for describing arrays and, and operations on arrays. And JSON's been used for dealing dealing with hierarchical data structures and all kinds of data exchange on the web. So at its core, Conduit's about describing things in core, so in your memory. And then on top of that, you can build services like communication or I.O. or serialization. All right. Due to uh, unforeseen technical difficulties, apparently the Internet fell apart in California. 
Uh, so we had to call uh, Cyrus back in on a regular old POTS phone, and we will now return you to your interview already in progress. Okay, so Cyrus, you said something a second ago um, that confused me a little bit. You said uh, you talked about how static APIs were bad, and assumedly that is in uh, contrast to dynamic APIs. Could you explain that a little bit further? Yeah, so I guess in, in a lot of other areas like web development or even in um, scripting languages, people are used to having a lot of flexibility with how they describe data, how they pass things around. And in HPC, typically, we have a lot of pre-existing APIs for, say, describing what a mesh is or something like that, or we, we try to solve the problem with code generation. Um, so we're building a big code. We have code generation that describes our complicated objects. And the problem with code generation is, is that while it gives you good performance, it, it becomes software engineering-wise pretty burdensome. So if you look at a tool like Visit, um, if we were to accept code-generated stuff from all the different codes that we want to read in to visualize, it would be really unbearable, uh, an unbearable process to get all their code and coordinate their own code generation schemes. So it, when we're talking about this stuff here, we're really not talking about how, how static and dynamic are, are you know, mortal em enemies. They're just different benefits to doing a dynamic approach. And by dynamic here, I really mean runtime. So you can do a full description in runtime and have introspection and things like that. So uh, can you give us a little bit more history about how this came about? Was this trying to solve the needs of a specific code or and that code you know, visit or some scientific code? Or is this just a general problem you keep running into? Yeah, so um, it started out with uh, some of the pain points with describing. So so with visit, we, we deal with mesh data and we use VTK, for example, for um, for describing our meshes. There's a lot of other things, though, that go along with it that are a little bit more complicated, like in a distributed domain parallel context, how those meshes on all the processors connect to each other, for example. This is hierarchical nature by hierarchical data by nature. And we, we, we have different kind of probably 10 different mechanisms for doing this in Visit. And some of them use packed binary data from specific codes, and some of them used APIs that were specifically designed to deal this, but then we'd find oh no, this, this, we, we have one corner case that kind of undermines our whole API. So what we were trying to do is we were trying to let the simulation code describe this data structure to us and have enough introspection so when it gets to visit that we can actually pull out you know, the pieces and, and get what we care about and what we need. And that's where it started out. And it's also an important aspect of trying to deal with um, sort of in situ visualization where it's easier to pass things zero copy, like a mesh zero copy from another code. So. A lot of jargon there, so I'll let, I'll let you chase me down on those things. So you you keep mentioning you know this is this is really for you know something a tool like Visit to be able to kind of you know figure everything out on its own. Um, I, I don't necessarily want to go all the way to saying self describing, but it sounds pretty similar to that. I, is this already in Visit today? Like, is there a version of this in Visit today? So it's not released in Visit yet, but what we've done so over the last so again this project started in 2013. And actually, over the last year, we had a set of students from Harvey Mudd College working on it with us where we used it to replumb aspects of different simulation mini-apps. So um, there's, there's, these are common proxy applications that are used in procurement instead of just regular benchmarks. So what we did is we actually, it was pretty interesting, we went in and had the students kind of replumb the I.O., replumb the MPI, and replumb from connecting, you know, collecting performance data from the simulations, all just using conduit, which is kind of a simple building block. So we did these ex experimentations, and that gave us the confidence that, hey, this is going to work well. Um, so now we're starting to figure out how to roll it out and visit and you know, solve the specific problems of the code we were looking at you know, starting a couple years ago, and then also ex expand it out to be used for more, lots more things, I think. Well, let me ask you then about, you know, Brock was just asking you about self-describing and you were talking about the APIs describing them and so the data itself and so on. These are also terms that are typically bandied about in the current hot sexy of unstructured data and big data and things yes. like that. Is this related to that at all? Because you've also been describing this in a hierarchical type of description, which implies more regularity that you could potentially use a much smaller description to describe a huge amount of data. Is this the same kind of playing field? So I think it could be. Um, I think the focus we really had, though, here was on numeric types. So that's why I talk about JSON cross with NumPy, right? So we, so, so we do, you know, we do, 
we could describe things in the big data realm as well. But the important thing for us here is to make sure that we have a, you know, a double. If we have a double array, we want to make sure we know it's 64 bits and we know the right Indianness and all these other things. So there's there's kind of extra special sauce that's specifically for scientific computing. So um, this is kind of interesting because I feel like when I first started learning HDF5 and then later on Adios, it seems like it already does a lot of these things. So what's 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 the real difference between these two systems? Yeah, so Conduit's simpler than both of those things, um, and it's specifically built for data description in core, and then other things are built on top of it. So it's not actually at its core an I/O library. So it so it so it won't be dealing. For instance, it could be used with Audios. Basically, Audios or HDF5 could be used behind the scenes to do do some I/O functionality, but it's really for in core. So if you wanted to pass between, you know in situ, basically, between one, the simulation, one part of a simulation, another part of a simulation, or a simulation, a visualization package. This gives you a very simple way to do that. Um, and that's, that's sort of where the line's drawn. Now, there's obviously a lot of the same concepts are involved with hierarchical nature and you know, the keys and all these things. But at, at its core, a conduit's about describing things as, as they already are in memory. So now you mentioned that uh, JSON is used as well, or JSON, or whatever the however the kids yep. pronounce it these days. Yep. Um, is that used when you do, you know, you're passing from point A to point B? So, like, if you have a, a one gigabyte array of of doubles, you pass it in a JSON format, or do you pass the description in JSON and then pass like just a native array of doubles? Yeah, so this description would be passed in JSON. And so JSON allows you a really easy way to describe the data in core. And then basically we have a schema that you – it, it doesn't always hold everything in JSON, but from going from point A to point B, you would create a JSON schema that does the description, and you could send the binary data separately, for example. So does this – I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think about So do you, like – allocate your arrays using, you know, like new conduit array and you know, like, like what, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly how I would work this into my application or if this is something I kind of write afterwards, almost like XDMF or something like that, where I kind of like write it afterwards so someone can understand it's something I wrote someplace else. Or is this actually like in my application being passed around all the time? So it would be it, 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 it could sort of be both, I guess. That's a, that's a non-answer. But the way you the way you can use it is there's there's two ways. So if you already have data in your application that's describe that that's basically described through the basic set of types. Again, think NumPy, like floating point arrays or integers or strings. Um, you can you can create this conduit object that just describes the data that already exists and owns nothing. So the conduit object doesn't own anything but a description of it which is nice because that allows you to zero copy data. But it also has a dynamic API where you can just build kind of trees of trees of hierarchical data on the fly and just sort of through the magic of some, some especially in C++, some overloading, you can really easily build up these data structures and have, a, have your own copy of them, I guess. Once you have it sort of codified into a conduit object and this hierarchy, then the, the use of them really looks exactly the same, I guess. So this sounds uh, relatively similar to the MPI data type uh, concept. And, and I see that you have some conduits that speak to MPI types of uh, entities. Do you, is there a mapping between uh, the JSON data types that you create and MPI data types or, or optional data types uh, mapping you know, if you're talking to an MPI entity? So we've, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, it's something that we would do in the future, but we haven't got there yet. So for MPI operations now, um, basically we, we know how the data is described and we know how it's laid out in core, so we can do serialization. So we do serialization for our MPI features currently, but we could do a more robust coupling with the MPI data types in the future. So what kind of data types do you handle? So the, the MPI data types are, are both great and terrible at the same time in that they can represent anything. 
Um, and, and that's both good and bad because mm -hmm. to uh, there's a couple of, of shortcuts for, for describing simple things, but when you want to describe complex things, you can, but it's, it's, uh, it takes a little bit of work to do that. How does one describe data in, in conduit? Is it an easy thing? Is it a hard thing? What's the interface like? Does it just figure it out via introspection? How, how does that work? So fundamentally, it's, it's, it's meant to be very easy, and it's meant to limit, sort of limit the data model. But basically, there's three different things you can have. So you can have an object, which is really an associative array, right? So that's how you get some hierarchy. So that, that object would contain names of other things, like a pressure field or something like that. You can have a list, which is a, just a linear ordered non-named thing, so just a whole bunch of, a blob of a whole bunch of heterogeneous things. Or you can have a leaf type, which is one of these concrete arrays. So it could be an array of floating point numbers. It could be a, a string. And there's different striding twi swizzles and stuff like that on those in order to allow you to, basically, if you're doing structs or arrays or arrays or structs, there's tricks you can play with how you do the indexing to make it all look nice. But if you're just dynamically creating an object, you can just go and use almost like a, uh, it's basically like an associative array or a dictionary syntax, even in C++. So you can just give it a name and you assign it a value and it'll figure out the right type for you. And then there's some more special sauce for dealing with complicated arrays if you have striding and things like that. So uh, I want to think about something like using external libraries, like BLAST libraries or FFTW or something like that. And, you know, say sometimes have special things like, well, you know, we know this is going to be symmetric, so I'm only going to return half the, half the data. Can I describe things like that so that it, it knows that it's symmetric, or is that kind of not really the intended use of this? So it's, 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 it's not meant to solve some of those higher-level problems. It's meant to just solve sort of things in core, but that said, you can go a long way with having, a, having this hierarchical notion to give a lot of context for things. You can, I guess, describe things starting at any offset you want to as well. So there, there could be a way, if you envision that it only returns half an array or it return, returns a pointer somewhere you know, strange from an offset in the beginning of, a, of where you started, you could do that. You could encode that in a conduit node and just return that back, and it would have a description to where that started and how to access it all. Okay, right. so um, if, I, if I'm using conduit in my application, should I really be describing every single one of my data structures using a conduit describer object or w whatever you're calling them? Or should I really only be doing it for the things I plan to either communicate to another application to do something like in-situ virtualization or to do I.O. to disk with to be able to, again, describe it to another application? It's really about portability of data structures between applications and not within an application. Yeah, I think the fundamental focus is really between applications. Um, there's, there's, you know, it's nice to have your all of your data self-described, but there's going to be a per performance penalty from doing that, right? So this is sort of about coupling. It's about getting data from A to B with context. Now, if it's for talking between applications, does that necessarily always mean that there is a disk in between, or can other flavors of IPC be used? Oh, no, definitely not. So, I mean, the easiest way to talk in between applications would be via a library, right? <laughs> so so that's, that's actually like an in-situ visualization use case. Now, why is that different from just passing a pointer? Well, again, it's the context. So it's easy for you to pass a pointer from, from one library to another, but this gives you a little bit more context. So as simple as passing, a, you know, passing an array from one, from one part of your code to another, that could be the case. The, the difference here is the context. So if two parts of those code are sufficiently complicated, then you might want to have some context between them. There's also, you could use MPI to send things, right? Um, IO is, doesn't have to be part of the picture. All right, now, does, it doesn't have to be part of the picture. Can it be part of the picture? Can you write uh, conduits out to files and then read them back from files? Yes, yes, you certainly can. So um, right now, it just has a basic capability which, sa which saves out a schema and uh, saves out a kind of a binary representation. It has some experimental capabilities for writing actually mesh-aware data out to Silo, which is a library we have here at Livermore. Um, in the future, we're probably going to deal with um, putting HDF5, uh, you know, kind of having a fundamental I.O. capability that uses HDF5 on the back end in order to get things out in a better, more performant way. Okay, so so you have your own format, and you're also looking at, at using some other underlying formats. But uh, you know, there's there's some things where 
there's these you know file per process and you have to describe everything back um, or you know there's methods like MPIO or you know some other types where you can kind of have something that's a little bit easier for a human to manage you know a single file for a, a large you know partitioned type problem across processors but you know has other issues involved with it so does conduit favor one of these or does conduit not care or is conduit not even bother with it so it's um, I guess it's, it, it doesn't care at a fundamental level, but it will, one thing it will make easier, I think, is the sort of in the middle case, which is where you want to – not doing one giant file or not doing one file per process, but you want to be able to collate some data sort of hierarchically and get it out to a file system. So, you know, using many, many processes per file, I guess. And I think Mark Miller from the, from the Visit and Silo team has a has – a, uh, Multiple, I, I forget what it's called. There's, there's a term for this, right? But because it can do things with MPI and because it can serialize and help you serialize and things, it helps you get data around. So it'll help you be able to make choices like, well, I want to col- collect this data together and, and maintain context. That's something it can help out with. But it's not going to fundamentally pick, you know, you must do one file per, per process or you must do, you know, MPI IO one file, one giant file. It's not going to fundamentally try to take a stand there, I guess. I'll try to avoid controversy. <laughs> so what languages are uh, supported here by Conduit? You mentioned NumPy, so, so are we talking primarily Python? So it's actually, um, it's all developed in C++. And C++ is the, is the kind of where all the features come from, so it's underpinned by C++. But there's also a, a fledgling C API, a Fortran API, and there's a Python API as well. So the goal is is to have sort of it's, it also helps you solve this sort of language confusion issue where you have to again a lot of times you have to do a lot of code generation for multiple languages. But since we're describing things in core with this kind of hierarchical model, the APIs are pretty sane in all of these different um, different. They look very very similar, you know, modulo syntactic sugar C++ probably in Python look the best, but. The C and the Fortran APIs are actually pretty usable for doing this stuff. So that's another goal of the project is to try to have, once you have these things described, make it easy to use in, in these different languages. Well, I think you get a gold star, sir, for being probably the first person on the planet to mix Fortran and JSON. <laughs> That so, so, is fantastic. so I had to learn Fortran to do this project. So uh, I, I avoided it up to up to this point. And uh, <laughs> but actually, it's been very, very, very good. Um, so some of our simulation codes, obviously, Fortran is immensely important for HPC, and we had some success of coupling a uh, Fortran mini app in order to do some in situ visualization stuff. And that was a that was a big win because they were looking at this API the customers and saying, "Yeah, this is this is actually usable." <laughs> so it was good. All right, take a quick cut here, break. I, I sincerely hope you are using strongly typed definitions because it, uh, I, I hate to admit that I know quite a bit about Fortran now because of my MPI stuff. But the uh, the newer, modern, like Fortran 08 is actually even stronger typed than C++. And you can do some actually really nice things with it. And I, I hope you guys are going that direction rather than like the mpif.h totally implicit specification of everything um, kind of stuff. If you want, I'd be happy to talk to you about it for five or ten minutes when we're done. So we're trying, uh, so we're actually we're using ISO C bindings to do a lot of what we're a lot of what's working here. But um, I guess that is good. But, yeah. But so, on, so that, on, the, that, on the Fortran interface side, though, I hope it's all explicit and all that kind of good stuff. I think uh, I think you know I, I might be committing some sins there, so I won't lie. But um, again. <laughs> This is um, so it's sort of one data model for all these languages, and it's a limited data model. So I think people okay. can use it without shooting themselves in the foot. All right. Well, let's let's chat after recording because I think sure. Brock sure, probably sure, sure. want to shoot himself in the head if we talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you said this started getting developed only um, what was it two years ago? So uh, is the API stable? Is this something that like we just really start? If we have some of these needs, we want to be able to pass between applications, maybe do some in situ work, coupling standalone applications together. Is, is this something we should go ahead and start using? So I think uh, so. The the core conduit library itself is is uh, pretty fleshed out in terms of functionality. Um, the C plus plus API in particular, we're still we're still filling out the Fortran APIs and still filling out the C APIs. 
Um, there's a couple of other things that are that are new in there. For instance, like the M Conduit MPI and some of the I/O stuff, which isn't fully fleshed out. So I don't think that would be ready for prime time yet. But uh, I think the ideas and kind of the basic library are 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 ripe for using now. So actually, I had another idea that came up during this. Um, so you talked about using MPI to communicate, and it doesn't have to be. Um, it doesn't have to be a file to communicate between stuff. What are some of the things that does does conduit worry about any of that communication stuff um, for when you have like say you have visit running with libsim over here? Well, maybe that's a bad example because that's specifically you're working on. But say say I have standalone visualization application running over here, and I've got my simulation running over here. Does conduit allow for that kind of like pause exposed data, and it's available via TCP, shared memory, or verbs? something like that for this other application to read and Conduit kind of provides all of that. So right now it 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 does things over MPI only with the MPI library and then the other the other swizzle we have on this is um it has basically has an embedded you can optionally have an embedded web server that allows you to get things to the web browser, which is kind of interesting. So you via web sockets. But we haven't done any other transport layers for like IPC or, or anything like that. Um, if we did, that would sort of be at a higher level of functionality. It wouldn't be built into the core of Conduit, but it would be sort of a service built on top of it, maybe using Nano Message or some 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 other you know sort of IPC thing, um, or some other you know exotic network that would work well. Now, as long as we're flashing back in time in the conversation, there there is a question I forgot to ask too. Why JSON? Why not something else? Where, how'd you end up there? So pick Jason because uh, it sort of infected my brain a few few years ago, and it's been immensely useful for me for uh, dealing with a lot of Python programming. Um, I guess it's just very intuitive, and I think YAML would have also been a good choice. I think XML becomes more complicated because there's so many ways to, to interpret it. So um, so Jason, there's one way to interpret it, and it works really well across multiple languages, and I've seen that. Um, you know, with my Python stuff and with how it's treated in C++. So, um, so that's why I picked it. Um, I think, um, and basically all this, you know, all the print things for human readability all shoot out JSON stuff. So I think it's, 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 I've convinced myself that it's fairly intuitive, and I think I've convinced a lot of other people it is too, but it, it may not be the absolute 100% perfect choice, but um, it, it was a good one. Do you notice any performance issues in having to convert back and forth to JSON or is the JSON always, you know, metadata and so therefore relatively small typically in comparison to the actual data that's being passed around as a blob? Yeah, that's that's the kind of sweet spot for where we want to use this, right? The, uh, the metadata should be smaller and we're dealing with kind of bigger arrays and larger data sets. Um, if, if we were to um, want to target more kind of fine-grained things where the metadata approaches the size of the actual data we're passing around, we probably would switch to some, some specific binary pack format or something, which would probably look something like, like message pack or bison or some, something like that, um, but uh, would just be, you know, would, would be a different kind of, a different schema description protocol. But again, the sweet spot is you have it's sort of like XDMF. You have the, the metadata the metadata description, which is 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 small in comparison to this big data that you're hoisting around. So so let's talk about the scalability of this a little bit. Um, so we can describe partition data across processors. So let's talk about you know the the biggest simulation that you know of or can talk about um, that's used this, as well as probably an example of a code that does lots and lots of descriptions, like it has lots of different data formats and has lots and lots of descriptions, because you did mention that there's a small performance overhead when dealing with this. Yeah, so we haven't, we haven't characterized it very well yet. Um, it's, it's sort of a, it's, you know, it's, it's a dynamic sort of runtime API, so a lot of the things that you're doing are going to sort of feel like what you would get from a scripting language, right? It's probably not as painful as, as, as all scripting languages would sort of feel like that. Um, we've used it to pass data. Um, so, so we've used it to pass data for an in-situ context. And I think we, we did it up to already 4,000 cores. And this, you know, the, the description of the data actually doesn't really, I mean, we're, we're passing it actually zero copies. So the description of the data really isn't very p punishing on the performance at all. Um, as far as what we're 
aiming to do, so one, one of the things we're aiming to do is, is back to this original sort of description of how processors talk to each other. Uh, we're aiming to try that on like a 500,000 core simulation. So, and we will learn a lot when we do that. I'm sure we will. Um, but uh, we haven't had a chance to dive into that yet. Um, it's, but it's on the horizon. So we'll, we'll see. We'll learn, we'll learn how well it works out. Now, what kind of other applications do you kind of foresee on the horizon, right? You've talked a bunch about, you know, HPC style of applications with, you know, well hierarchical structured data that can have small metadata conduits describing them and passing between libraries in the same process and things like that. What else do you see as being a useful scenario for this conduit type of, of passing? So we, um, we're trying to sort of, another thing we're, we're playing with and we hope will be successful is sort of blowing open how to connect our simulation codes to the web and particularly sort of client-side technology of the web because every supercomputer usually has a web browser on it and sometimes that's easier to build than X11 or it comes from the vendor, right? So there's a lot of great stuff you can do with a web browser now um, as far as analytics or visualization and we would like to have a good way of you know describing data between the two and getting data, even if it's not big data, getting data between it. That's also another key reason why JSON was used because JSON will arrive at the web browser and sort of is is is, is at home there. So some of the things that we were doing um, with the new in situ capability actually is is using conduit to talk over a web socket to a web browser and just send the image from rendered from a from a from a simulation back. And uh, it just makes things a lot easier if you can do this, and you you have to you have sort of a natural context that also works on the web. So actually, as we've been ramping up for this data science initiative at the university, uh, we've been having a lot more requests for people who want to access data at our hospital and data at the you know our U of M Transportation Research Institute and stuff. And a lot of people are like, oh well, just just use web APIs. But we've actually been finding difficulty, um, and I'm curious if we're going to run into this too that. A lot of these web APIs are not good for handling, like, if you want the entire history of the entire stock market, it really doesn't work that well. Um, it's still much better to kind of, like, offline dump that and move it around, and that's also manually intensive. So I, I'd be really curious what you come up with over the next couple of years. Yeah, so I think for the for the web stuff, we we're very much you know we're very much at the beginning here. We're trying to send smaller sets of data back and provide people context. But again, so if you can describe things with conduit, um, whether you go to the web or whether you go to C plus plus, it sort of looks the same way. So there's there's going to be some usefulness there, I think, in in how you can curate data with a solution like this. Let me ask you one question that I ask uh, all developers who, who come on our program. What uh, version control system do you use for your software development and why? So we're using Git for this. Um, so we are publishing the code on GitHub. That's one reason for using Git because it's, 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 it's uh, fairly common. But we also have an internal, sort of at Livermore, we have an internal uh, Git repository system and we use the Atlassian tools for managing bug tickets and managing, you know, for wikis for data exchange or for ID exchange and stuff like that. Um, so as as far as Git versus um, versus Mercurial or something like that, I think the more important thing is probably this distributed version control is it's it's kind of freed up things to where it's easier to work on an airplane when you're flying across the country and push things and and and, and get things right. But um uh, so so Git was the solution um, and you know I could talk about some of the more of the software engineering stuff that we also selected for conduit if you're interested. So if it's on GitHub, I assume this is a uh, open source. Uh, what license is this under? It's a it's a BSD style license. So um, so then that's that's our preference. So it could be used in commercial commercial things as well. Without uh, without you know some some of our commercial partners, particularly on Visit, um, would be turned off by a copyleft thing. So we use we we use BSD. So how does one uh, Google for conduit? It's unfortunately a very common word and. Unfortunately, it has a, a name conflict with uh, some kind of virus or something, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I, I noticed that like last week when I was dealing with my grandfather's computer. That was quite unfortunate. That I discovered that. <laughs> um, so, so its 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 presence on the web is really new. It's only uh, arrived on GitHub and arrived with you know GitHub documentation and stuff over the last two months. So it's probably uh, 
hard to Google for Conduit itself. Um, if you if you search for scalability LL on L, you'll find a GitHub group that has a set of tools, and Conduit sort of lives under there right now. So scalability dash LL on L, LL on L for Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And that's where the Conduit repo is, and they're also linked to the doc, current set of documentation is there as well. Okay, we'll put links to that stuff in the show notes too. So uh, if, if assuming this is all open source and stuff, how does one actually contribute and communicate with the group? So we have um, so obviously through GitHub would be a good a good um, a good sorry <clears throat> sorry hold on, pause so through GitHub would be obviously good opening up issue requests there and things we track also things separately internally at Livermore right now just just based on how things are working but you can email me um, I'm I, I will be the one to respond so Cyrus Cyrus H at LLNL.gov and I can give you more information on how we could attack things. Cyrus, thanks a lot for your time. All right, thank you. Thanks for having me.